So, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to tonight's Open Room session, Common Ground, um, a session discussing some of the outcomes from two of our uh, recent micro commissions. My name is Emma Case. Um, I'm social practice producer at Open Eye Gallery in Liverpool, and I have with me artists Kira Leeming and Marge Bradshaw. Um, just before we start, if we can just do a little bit of housekeeping, we have a bit of time at the end for some Q and A's. Um, and so if you have any questions or comments, um, if you have a Twitch account, you can, I think, add the questions to the chat. Um, if you don't have a Twitch account, then feel free to head to Twitter. You can at OpenEye and ask us a question on there, or you can DM us a question and uh, one of our team, Nat, will pick the question up and forward it onto us. Uh, we'll also be recording this session and it'll be added to our YouTube channel. Okay, so tonight we'll be discussing two micro commissions from our Crossing Sectors program. Um, Crossing Sectors is Open Eye Gallery's six month training program for socially engaged photographers. Um, it supports practitioners to explore how culture can be co authored. Uh, we have facilitators and speakers across the health, youth, environment, and community settings, along with sessions around diversity, safeguarding, and funding. Um, this year, we offered two Crossing Sectors participants micro commission opportunities in the lead up to Look Climate Lab from January to March 2022, uh, which will be centered on climate catastrophe and environmental concerns and how we can partner with and learn from others. The two commissioned participants, Marge and Kira, developed socially engaged projects which responded to the climate crisis with regards to impact within their local areas. So tonight, we'll be finding out a little bit about each project, but also having a wider discussion about the role of micro commissioning, uh, particularly from an artist's perspective, how it can shape a project, the expectations, the challenges, and also the benefits. Uh, so that's enough from me, I think. So I think, shall we get into it? Um, first up, I think it's Marge. So Marge, are you okay to share your screen? I am. <clears throat> Thanks, my love. Can you, can you see that okay, Emma? Wonderful, yeah. Okay, um, so hi everyone, I'm Marge. Um, I'm based in West Horton, which is in Bolton, um, and West Horton looks a bit like this. I'm a documentary and portrait photographer, and I'm, I suppose, fairly new to socially engaged practice. I've only been working as an artist, I guess, for the last probably two or three years, um, because I've always been on the other side of the fence behind the scenes in museum and gallery jobs. So I saw this micro commission very much as an R&D for me to play about, um, learn some new approaches and keep trying out different methods that I've started exploring myself and just see what perhaps might work if the project was for a bit longer. So for my micro commission, I decided to explore the community's response here in West Horton to the local environment and in particular the loss of green space due to the housing and industry building that's going on here. And I suppose I wanted to instigate a creative conversation about the pros and cons of development, especially on Greenbelt. So I pretty much set out to record and document what might be lost or gained. Um, share some photography skills and give a creative outlet for talking about hopes and fears and also to explore what that creative outlet might actually be with the people taking part as things um, went along. So before I go into the process I just want to give a quick bit of context about West Horton and the situation with the green space here um, before we get any further with process stuff. So there's about 27 I think 27,000 people in West Horton Locally, it's known as Halfen, and that's why my project ended up being called Halfen Spaces. It's just off the M61, so it's very much seen as a place for not just commuters, but also as somewhere that's prime land for industrial development because of the good transport links. And at my last count, there was around 1,800 or so houses either under construction or with planning permission here. And those bills don't include any additional facilities like doctors or schools. And those are the ones that you can see on um, the map on the bottom uh, left there in, in red. And that includes over 300 homes just off the fairways and a large industrial estate proposal here. And so I focus a lot of my project around these two developments in particular. Both of those are 
in addition to the new Halton Park estate development, which is also being built on, and that's that um, big square green bit of land you can see there. And all of these are being built on green belt. You can see, hopefully, there's only a few pockets of green left on the map there um, in West Halton. It's an ex coal mining town. Um, it's got available brownfield sites, but the green is obviously cheaper to build on. And local forums are filled with people talking about their concerns about the building and things like the resulting traffic, whereas others think it will bring jobs or provide housing for their families so they don't have to move away. So it's a contentious issue locally. And of course, that sits within the context of the national housing crisis debate, especially around the lack of affordable homes. So that's kind of scene set in. And I tried out four different approaches to basically start a creative conversation with people about all of this topic. So the first was um, mindful photography runs. So I got four members of uh, the local running uh, club together, which is called Health and Runners. And we did some photo runs where I basically toured the runners around two of the development sites, which I mentioned before. And I could have recruited more runners, I think, but I wanted to keep it small, given that this was just an R&D. Um, so I gave them basic photography skills training um, and they each got a macro lens for their phone, which they're very excited about. And um, the runs were designed really to instigate a conversation about their opinions on the loss of green, uh, green space, but also to think about the role of nature and the outdoors in well-being, given that these were runners and what they'll do without it. So we took photos and recorded audio from those runs, including the noise from pile drivers that um, was going on around the sites at the time and some of the bird calls we could hear. And I gave them different tasks to do by themselves after the runs um, that we did together. And I got them to share their images and thoughts on a closed Facebook group. To be honest, these started off more about engaging as a conversation rather than anything else, but ended up evolving into producing some work. But we had lots of conversations about the not in my backyard and in the point of view whilst we were running and the fact that if people continue to want everything now, like deliveries from Amazon in two hours, these warehouses need to go somewhere. The second experiment was around bringing all the community viewpoints into the mix. So I put an online submission page together for the public to upload their own stories and reflections and images. And by doing that, that also meant I could get consent and their details as well with it being on my website. But there were some pros and cons to that, which perhaps we can chat about later. I also shared the link on different local Facebook pages and on my social media and um, also door dropped 100 flyers or so at houses next to some of the developments and I got around 34 I think it was submissions from the community over about a month or so I, I didn't push it massively and I didn't have any kind of success measure but I was I was fairly pleased with that and you can see them on the project page on my website which is just scrolling through here and I also use this kind of as a holding place to share my own responses alongside the community ones as as things got going a lot of the submissions were about how awful it is, um, whereas I'd have liked to have had some more balance in there from people who do support the developments, but it's not a popular local opinion. And people who were pro-development who did contact me separately often didn't want to publicly share their view or images even anonymously. The third thing I ended up testing was creating activities specifically for families living next to the developments. Um, and you can see the view some of those families have on the right there. A couple of the runners and public contributors said it might be useful to get children views into the mix and it, it wasn't something I was planning to do. Um, but I kind of ran with that and decided to try out some magic photography kits um, for kids. So I made some cyanotype paper. I must say thank you to Alan from our Crossing Sectors cohort for showing me how to do it because I'd never done it before. Um, and I put some instructions together in a nice little envelope and pack and door drop them to people I'd met or got talking to through the community submissions who lived in these particular spots. So it's fairly organic. And those packs invited families to go on a walk around the nearby green belt that they'd be losing collect up nature materials and use those to create their cyanotype. And the kids could share their written stories or thoughts with me or not. Um, and I invite them to share their work or recommend the pack to other families who might want to take part. And one of them sent me these pictures of the kids doing it, which was great. I also started experimenting with my own responses uh, around this time and ended up playing around with how I could show the loss we were dealing with here through photograms. So I used some of the 
iPhone images I'd taken um, during our photo runs and made those into the same types. But before I coated the paper, I printed open source maps of the development sites. We'd run around onto each piece. And then when I'd created the first cyanotype, I then basically overused excessively uh, eco bleach toning to start purposefully destroying the work. And I did that over two or three stages and photographed each one. So all that's physically left um, is the map that I printed uh, onto. So the work reflected the landscape and the runners on the trails, they usually run through disappearing away. And then finally, I wanted to go back to some of the people who'd been involved and had particularly interesting stories to share. So I asked two of the people who'd contributed to take me on photo walks to expand on some of those conversations they started in their public submission. One was Barry, you can see here, who hopefully is watching tonight. He's a local part-time farm worker who showed me around some of the land he's worked for many years and told me stories about nature and the loss of this this space and the impact that he thinks it will have on the landscape and nature and wildlife and his work. The photo on the right there that you can see is Barry's from 2013. He's actually a keen photographer himself. And we ended up just kind of accidentally really in the same spot on our walk, which you can see on the left there. And that's where the building work is taking place on the fairways just behind uh, that pond. But for me, this, this wasn't really about the, po the portrait and the finished work. It was about that process of conversation and the act of walking together through the land and getting to know someone in my community that I didn't know and, and hearing their story. And then Katie, who's a runner, but actually wasn't in my focused group of runners. And she'd submitted some work about the loss of trail. So I went back to her and again, we took a tour alongside one of the ongoing developments. And for both of those participants, I created these um, environmental portraits, which is more my kind of usual um, comfort zone and work and what, what, um, what I tend to, to do more often. I also did some of the half and runner group members as well. And then I went back to the cyanotypes using some of those environmental portraits I'd taken. Um, if you want to see any more about the process I went through with all of these and the project, you can look at my Instagram highlights, which is called, um, well, the link's on there, but the highlights is called Halfen. Um, and there's a link on the slide there as well to my website where you can have a look at them on the project page. There's loads more I wanted to do if I had the time, but um, I guess I had to stop somewhere and perhaps we can talk about that. But it's been a really great opportunity just to have permission to play and try different things out. And um, yeah, I've learned a lot along the way. And I'll pass back to you, Emma. Thank you, Marge. It's been so nice to actually see everything because obviously we've had little check ins now and again, but it's just so nice to hear the whole overview. Um, I was going to ask before we move on to Kira, I was just going to ask, because obviously with a micro commission, you're kind of experimenting, you're able to try different things. Um, and obviously you you really managed to sort of really go for it and try quite a lot of different things. Um, what would you say maybe you feel not was most successful, but something that you might expand on? Or do you feel like it would be a mixture of everything? You know, is there anything that sticks out for you that you were doing? I think it's that um, age old issue of kind of I'd want to do all of it a lot more so I think I think all of it has legs and I've got a long list of other stuff that could have been done as well so like you know the community um public submission could have worked on a Facebook group and gone absolutely crazy because of the the attention this is getting locally but I just didn't have the time to kind of manage that so I think all of it has legs to be done in a different way or expanded or explored but for me as much as you know I, I love the environmental portraits and the cyanotypes and the the work that was submitted it was all about the conversations and really for me when I started this I really wanted to and I know like when we were on crossing sectors and working with yourself and Liz we did a lot of talk about product and process and not getting hung up with the product and I am a I am a product person and so for me I really really wanted to try hard um, to really think about the process this time and that's why I started off thinking it'll just be about the conversations and learning about you know walks in the landscape and getting other people to take me on those or share those with other people so I think for me, it's just opening up those opportunities for new contacts and, and for me, learning the area as well, because I've not lived in West Horton all that long myself. So, yeah, I guess I'd say that that process element. But of course, I loved I loved seeing like the reactions from the kids with the magic photography kits and all that. I mean, there's nothing rocket science in anything that I've done here. It's just I think 
for me, because this is such a new way of working, it did feel quite new and um, interesting to try just a few things out. So, yeah. I think um, definitely, I think what you're talking about really is that, I mean, I'm a very much product, I think we're, we're probably all very much product driven a lot of the time. I think it's like instilled in our brains, but I really like the fact that if you are given the permission to just look at process, then actually things evolve in a really organic way. And so, you know, the, the focus is much broader and you kind of relax in a weird, well, when I say that, we might talk about not relaxing <laughs> in a bit, because sometimes it's not that easy to relax, is it? Um, but yeah, thank you so much for uh, sharing that. That was wonderful. Um, okay, Kira, shall we have a listen to what you've been up to? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm gonna stick myself on you. Hi. Okay, so um, my name is Kira, and I'm a photographer from um, Manchester. I live in an area called Levenshoom. Um, and my background is actually journalism, but I'm, I've been taking photos sort of in parallel for about 12 years now, um, but normally in quite a much more straightforwardly documentary kind of way. Um, and so what I decided to look at was the issue of litter in um, my community, but I think I think probably most urban communities, it's a serious problem in this country. Um, it's something that really riles me. I see it everywhere I go. Um, it just makes me so, so cross. Um, and, and lots of other people too in our area. Um, I often go litter, organize litter picks with my family. Even my kids know to pick up litter. Um, we can't understand why people leave the place in such a mess. So one of the things that I noticed during the lockdown period was in Manchester and probably Greater Manchester as a whole, um, there seemed to be quite an explosion in um, like volunteer litter picking Facebook type groups um, where people were um, starting to, I think, um, I think probably it's because we were we were all sort of going out in our own local communities a lot more than we had been in the past. Um, but it seemed to me that lots of people were were getting litter pickers and they were spending their time when they were walking their dog litter picking or they were going to these organised litter picks. Um, and the thing where I live and across the region, I think councils started to um, give people litter pickers and bags and things and to um, to say that you know if you've picked stuff up you can leave it near a bin or a lamppost or something like that and it'll be collected so it was and I, I, I noticed i found myself being added by friends to lots and lots of groups and i thought this was quite interesting um so what i thought would be quite nice to do is because these some of these groups have got hundreds or even thousands of members um so i thought i would use them as a kind of a network of people um, and to try and pick their brain and um, crowdsource some images and thoughts really about this problem and about what motivates them to pick litter and also what the probable what the possible solutions are to the problem as well. So the first thing I did was to join about 25 litter picking groups across Greater Manchester um, and to start basically spamming them with um, uh, an appeal, a flyer that I'd made appealing for help. And people immediately kind of got behind this and started sharing it. And um, very quickly, people started sort of in, um, sending me, because I was asking people not just to send me the photos of the cans and the and the face masks and stuff, but also the, the really random things that people, people were picking up, because people are picking up all kinds of things that have been fly tipped and littered. Um, and so, you know, people started sending me all sorts of photos. Um, and I, I also, uh, sort of found that I had to um you know because these groups are used by people who who when they go litter picking they then upload their picture of what they've collected onto the Facebook group and it kind of actually it kind of encourages other people to do the same and so I was kind of lurking in these groups and commenting under photos that I found were particularly interesting and you know begging people to email them across to me so it worked quite well and these are all the people that I engaged with over the um the course of the project so there was quite a lot of litter picking groups on the right there um, that I contacted and requested and then I had around 35 different people send me pictures pictures and words or just words um, which was great um, so I just thought I'd share a couple of um, sort of thoughts some of the people some people sent me some really lengthy um, and deep kind of thoughts about this issue and um, but I just thought I'd show you a couple of them. So 
this chap took a picture of this swan surrounded with litter in her nest. So he was talking, um, he's talking, I won't read the whole thing, but he's talking, you know, about the impact on wildlife as well. You know, people, people are bothered about the sort of um, the playgrounds and stuff that have got litter on, but he's talking about the damage to the creatures and, um, you know, the face masks that they can strangle themselves on, batteries, toxic waste, plastic bags, syringes, all that kind of thing. How arrogant, thoughtless and selfish are human beings to treat their fellow creatures with such disregard? I wish I could apologize to all the animals and birds for the way us humans behave. And then there's this other group from Stratford in Greater Manchester in Trafford. And this um, woman is Australian. And she talks about, uh, the picture is 81 dog poo bags collected in quite a short run of um, canal, which is absolutely shocking, really, when you think about it. What's the point in picking up dog poo and then leaving the bag? Um, but so she's talking about how she's Australian and um, they don't have this problem in Australia at all. And so she finds it really startling um, that we put up with this and that um, we aren't angry and we just kind of will sit on the beach next to piles of litter and stuff like that. And she, and, and she knows what's possible. Um, so that's kind of partly why, partly why she picks up litter. Um, so in, in the course of the project, in the sort of month or six weeks or whatever it was that I was doing it, um, I had around 35 people send me um, photographs and in total there was something like 450 images, um, which is obviously a lot and too many for me to use. So what I, what I decided to do was to kind of, you know, thin that down and pick the best and the most representative kind of um, range of images and then I started to group them into sort of loose categories so these are four different um, grids that I made so the top left grid is kind of loosely sort of toys and child related stuff um, the one below that is kind of you know going from sort of drug bags to bottles of beer and vodka and things to um, nitrous oxide canisters to syringes to balloons balloons are a big problem um, and then there's, there were so many pictures of shoes and boots that had been mislaid. There were really random things like um, dentures and um, uh, a set of hand things, like, <laughs> obviously not a real one. Um, all kinds of things, loads of sex related stuff as well, because there's some of the sites that people litter pick out are dogging sites. So there's all kinds of things picked up there. Um, and it goes on and on and on. And obviously some of the crisp packets are from the 90s and drinks bottles and stuff. It's, it's just absolutely shocking. So a bit like Marge, I used the opportunity to sort of use some techniques that I'd never used before. So I made a couple of gifts, um, but they turned out to be quite a lot of work. So I didn't really pursue that any further. Um, and then I was taking pictures. So that's kind of, the stuff that I was being given by other people. And then another strand of what I was doing was taking pictures myself. So I started off by just photographing certain things um, that bothered me the most. Nitrous oxide canisters are one of them. I started picking them up. Um, and the other thing was face masks because they just really get on my nerves. Um, and I also experimented a little bit with cyanotypes, which is not something that I've done before. So I made some digital negatives and then played around with cyanotype. But I didn't really feel it kind of worked particularly well for me, um, probably because I don't really have the skills and the interest wasn't hugely there. So then I went on a litter pick um, myself um, and sort of I went along and as I picked things up, I photographed them where they were. And then I kind of brought them back to put to put things in my bin. And I sorted through things so that I could put, you know, the recyclable stuff in my own bin. And then I thought, hang on, I think I should be scanning this, <laughs> scanning this. And luckily the house was empty and it, it was like, I felt really dirty and horrible doing this, but I, I took the litter in and I scanned it on my scanner. Um, and I thought I was going to be sick because I was scanning like face masks and cans and all kinds of really, really nasty things. Um, and it was just the most, I felt so ashamed of myself. <laughs> it was horrible. Um, and one of the things that I'd proposed to do um, in my proposal was to work with collage, which is something that I have a sort of slight growing interest with. Um, and in the past, all the collages that I've done have been hand cut collages. 
So I decided to get prints of all of the things that I'd scanned. And I also turned everything into a digital negative and got prints of photo, you know, from the from the Photoshop, got prints. And I started kind of experimenting with little things like weaving the photos together, making kind of very loose collages. And it was it was OK, but it wasn't again, didn't really feel like it had huge, hugely had legs as, a, as a, an approach. Um, and then I started experimenting with digital digital collages, sort of chopping things up and putting them back to putting them with other things that, that are similar. And again, it was OK, um, but it didn't really feel enough for me. Um, and also it made me feel sick. Um, and then the final thing that I did was I had also said that I would go on some litter picks and do some portraits of people, because quite often when I make collages, I work my own portraits into collages. Um, so I thought I would experiment with that. So I went to um, over the course of a few days, I went to three different litter picks in different parts of Man Manchester. I went to one in Mossside, I went to one in Salford and I went to one in Levenjean where I live. And I photographed all the volunteers um, who were there. And then I started playing around with working, with cutting them out digitally and um, working those portraits into collages. So I, I blogged the whole process as well, um, kind of talking about the ups and the downs and my anxieties and things that were going well. And I started, I, I came to the conclusion that what I had to do because these photographs of litter made me feel so physically repulsed. Like for a, for a little while, I thought, I don't think I can work with these because they make me want to vomit looking at the pictures. And I told somebody who lives on my street, who's quite arty and she was saying, you need to lean into this feeling because this is this is where the art is. And I was just like, oh God. So what I decided to do was to was to to make it a bit more subtle and to and to kind of cut into the the, the scans and not use the whole the whole face mask, but just use little elements of them and to try and build completely new images that way. And and it worked quite well. The picture on the left here um, is was the first one that I did. And um, I was quite pleased with that. And then I kind of carried on from there, really. And some of them worked better than others. Um, I didn't really have the imagination to, to pull the technique off for, for a particularly long time. Um, but I thought they, I was quite pleased with, with some of them. Um, quite pleased with the one on the left here. These are the people from Salford. Um, and yeah, so then, I mean, we've talked before about process, not product. But I, I, I felt that I needed to find a way, as much for the people who'd contributed material to me as for myself, although for myself as well, I felt like I had, to, I had in order to make sense of all this stuff that I had, which was all quite disparate parts, I felt for me it wouldn't be complete unless I pulled it together somehow, because I felt of, of responsibility to tell those people that it's contributed those 35 people like look this is what I did with what you gave me and not to waste because some of them really did they clearly had spent a really long time on crafting the words that they'd sent me so I spent a day kind of putting together a pdf where I pulled all of those things together and it's very very basic and simple but it, it, it kind of it's like a repository where everything is and and it and it felt like it it needed that otherwise things would be sort of hanging in the air at the end of the commission. So that's visible on my website. And uh, I think that's all I've got to say. Thanks, Kira. I am loving, literally loving hearing all, I don't wanna say outputs, <laughs> but I, I just really enjoyed listening to both of you. They're such good projects and you've done so much in a relatively short amount of time. Um, what I wanted to just, ask you Kira and actually this is a question as well for Marge I guess um you you said you were blogging your way through how much do you feel that that helps the process and you know as you're going through for me um I think it helped me a lot because um you know I'm a words person I'm yes I'm an images person but my I'm first and foremost I'm a words person I'm a former journalist you know that's how I process my ideas is by writing them down so, yeah, I, I just I don't really have anyone to talk to quite often about this sort of stuff because um, I don't really talk about it at home, what I'm up to. 
and um you know there are a few people like me and marge sort of communicated a little bit about it but you know it felt like it, it gets things out of your head doesn't it once you, even if nobody i'm not particularly promoting the blog i don't think anyone reads my blog particularly yeah. but it for me it was getting it out on the page it, it helps me to make sense of some of my ideas i think and do you feel um because I, I find it really interesting that you say you know i think both of you are nodded to this about having the product obviously for yourself because we all want to sort of tie it in that bow um but also for the participants and so how how do you feel about a asking people to to get involved um but also feeling like you're obliged to give them something at the end to show uh, you know that you're doing something with what they've given you <laughs> Shall I answer this? Um, first, um, I have no problem at all asking people to to get involved. This is kind of the way, it, using a different medium, this is the way I've worked for almost 20 years, but in different ways. I, I go out there, I find people to contribute their ideas. That's just what, I, what I've done as a freelance journalist. So it's not that different. Um, and also needling people when they forget is, again, I'm quite comfortable with that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't I don't have any I don't feel any kind of um, frustration with feeling like I need to make something because I think for it, it's as much for me as it is for them. I, I have a I, I want to draw a line under something and then go on to the next thing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's not like a, sen a negative kind of sense of obligation for me. I, 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 I think that's because I just said it's like I want to honour the effort that they've Put, that they've invested in that and they they've kind of invested in it by you know giving their support to the project and I think that mm. um it just feels right to me yeah yeah I, I don't I don't disagree with that at all I think my problem I've had with this project is my background as a marketing person because um <laughs> like I didn't have a problem approaching the people or trying to find them I know like I was talking I asked a question, I don't know if any of you saw the Craig Easton talk uh, through street level the other week. And I said, like, how did you find your people and, for this project? And, um, you know, he was saying, well, I just used my journalism skills that I've had for years and years. But like you were saying there, Kira, and I know I need to kind of maybe build that a little bit. But I didn't, didn't have any concerns about finding people. What the issue I had was I felt like people needed, um, like, not necessarily a hook, but the kind of the why. What was why should I bother sending you a picture of my local walk that's going to be decimated? Like, what's the purpose? What's the why? And so, with my marketing background hat on and my comms hat on, I was always trying to like, you know, sell what the benefits were of taking part. And for me, the product bit was that. So I did say to them, you know, lots of other things, but. Um, you know, your work will be in an online exhibition or online gallery, and it might even be at Open Eye Gallery even in the future and this kind of stuff. And that, I think, actually persuaded quite a few people who, who were interested to, to do it. But I think there's something interesting with, with both of our projects about just, like, finding that, um, that real impetus for doing something like we both have projects that were really like that meant something to people like, you know, the, the litter issue and the housing issue. And so the topic itself I think galvanized certain people but like I said in my presentation it I found it quite challenging to get a balanced view and it may be that the work that came in and the stories that came in reflected yeah. you know what the views are locally but like I so said I would have liked to have maybe found a way to involve some of those people who, who weren't necessarily against it um yeah. So yeah, it's the why for me and what and what that hook is and, and the messaging that I was putting out um, that, yeah. yeah, I kind of was a bit unsure about what I was doing. I checked in with Kira about I, that as well. I used the same, you know, I did the same thing, like this is supported by OpenEye, you know, this is a chance to get your opinions across, you know, talk about your motivation. So it's, we've, we've used the same technique really, with maybe just looking at it slightly differently. Um, it, so had to find you know you, you have to talk people into things is that's the skill isn't it yeah I mean I had that incident sorry Emma, I was just going to say like the, the thing that kind of stopped stopped me in my tracks with it was when I approached a local um kind of um group. what's the word I'm looking for? a group but like a, a not a lobbying group but you know 
a group that's against the local house building I won't name them um and you know they 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 just thought I was trying to do some advertising for my photography or my photography business and so just those conversations just getting them to understand what what I was doing and so in a place where you're being approached by an artist to say please can I have your image and your stories and just that tr developing that trust and I think that's something with a micro commission is I'm finding because I'm new to all this I'm finding it's, it's quite a challenge here because you haven't got that time to kind of build up that trust with say a particular group you kind of bish bosh bosh in a little bit um I don't know no I hear you and also I feel like the other thing that you both mentioned because you kind of um I think both of you were were sort of contacting people via Facebook and the Facebook group the other issue is that I found as well with with project is capacity and and how big does it go and how you manage that um you know how many participants do you bring in how many people can you physically keep afloat contacting you know um with with other commitments and so how how did you find that in terms of capacity do you want to go first Kira? <laughs> <laughs> so much. i think i think it was i don't want to speak for Kira, but i think it was challenging for both of us in terms of the timing with this one because it fell in the summer and we both have um kind of caring commitments at home and um kind of you know there's always going to be something in the way whenever this kind of thing or, or any work um comes along you've always got multiple things to do haven't you um usually but um yeah I think it was just quite I I, I had to rein myself in a little bit and I knew I had to at the start of this project because um it could have just got massive and I'm quite an advocate, as you know, Emma, of, you know, um, freelancers not working for free and artists, you know, um, being paid what they're, they're you know, paid for and, and recognising the amount of days that go into something like this. So that's why, like I said, I didn't, I didn't go down the route of maybe having an open forum with all the health and runners, because there's about like, there's like 400 of them. I could have opened it up and done loads of photo runs and then I could have done the community Facebook group. but. I, if I'm totally honest, I didn't want to spend my summer like firefighting on Facebook against like with these different local groups because it is quite controversial and it can get quite, quite angsty. And, and I didn't want to put myself in that position when I was trying to play an experiment. So I purposefully kept things quite, quite wee. And um, yeah, that 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 felt right for me at the time with the amount of days that we had and it being the summer and everything else that was going on as well so yeah and that's interesting as well actually because you know micro commissions commissions in general can be lots of different topics or you can choose to sort of focus on different topics but both of you are focusing on topics that do have a lot of emotion behind them and usually quite angry emotion behind them and as practitioners you are having to manage that um and it can be quite um quite a lot of responsibility on you know on, on your shoulders and so it kind of goes into sort of counselor <laughs> you know area if, if if you're not careful so sort of mental health wise as well you have to i guess be careful um no, yeah go on kira yeah i was just going to add um a point so i think maybe where our projects diverge slightly um whereas marge has quite focused and narrow in terms of the number of people she worked with. I think the difference um, be, um, with, with me is um, I cast my net, net a little bit wider because I was asking people, I was basically essentially crowdsourcing photographs that already existed mostly on people's phones and stuff or, or in these groups. Um, so um, I ended up, you know, if, if you've only got four people contributing, you, you, don't, you don't end up with, because I was really hoping to get this this kind of grid, you know, big number of uh, variety of different kinds of photos. So, yeah, but the downside of that, I mean, obviously, I, as you say, I, I, I kind of tried to keep a spreadsheet and, and try and be organised about it in the best way that I could. Um, but when I went to do my PDF thing at the end, I was basically kind of rushing, to be honest, because, you know, my kids were away for like two nights and I was, you know, bang, 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 needed to get it done. And, and, and I made some mistakes. I mean, they weren't huge mistakes. They weren't like er big errors in, I didn't get people's quotes wrong or anything like that, but 
but I missed one of the things, the, the Australian lady that I quoted earlier on, she'd written me, because what I did was I had this like load of folder, each person had their own folder on, um, in my system. And I kind of, as people sent me stuff, I would save that email in and the pictures in the same folder. And then I would kind of put them into um, Lightroom and, you know, and I just hadn't copied across her email onto my Word file when I came to edit everybody's stuff. And um, so I made this PDF and I kind of shared it with, you know, emailed it to all the contributors. And she came back and she was like, it's great they've used my photos, but um, I'm just wondering why you haven't used And she'd like written the longest and most detailed answer of all. And that was just, that was simply a case of rushing. So I've had to basically go and edit this PDF about four times now, which is why the link doesn't work on your website. <laughs> <laughs> because people, a few people came back and were like oh you know you put me as Becky but I'm actually Rebecca and it was it's just me and I'm not normally that sloppy but oh my this was like I need to get this done I need to get this done I need yeah. to get this done you know at the end because I just wanted it over with not in a <laughs> that, not like that oh, I know what you mean <laughs> you know what I mean I just needed to like I had other things starting this week and I just needed to be like right done that on to the next thing you know I didn't want it sort of lingering and so that, yeah that's that, the kind of bad thing about about having too many people but also from a from a commission perspective you don't actually really know how the end is going to wrap up and because you might plan well I'm going to do this I'm going to speak to people for this amount of time then I'm going to work on images then I'm going to do some like giving back to participants but actually the end always ends up a lot more of a crescendo than you you expected at the beginning and to try and factor in that it does end up always in a rush and yeah totally you're totally human and juggling lots of people and small children and everything is quite big um I've, we've got a question from amanda um how long did you have for the the commission how long was it <laughs> summer so <laughs> four, four, four days four to six days yeah it's more of a pay rate kind of scale it depends how you interpret the, the, the budget basically isn't it I yeah. spent more, a lot more than four days on it <laughs> no I think so I think um in terms of time scale I think you were given two months I think yeah I, I think I've mostly did it over the summer holidays so I think yeah. that yeah um, it felt like over the summer didn't it kind of maybe made the first approaches maybe at the end of June that kind of time yeah Mine was July, just slightly into August. But yeah, I was working on four to six days max. One, another question that I think uh, is interesting is, do you think you work differently with a micro commission than any other sort of jobs that you might do? Like, does it change how you approach people, how you work, how you how much you explore? Does it does it? do anything different well I haven't it's a bit hard for me to answer this because I haven't actually had any real commission <laughs> for this kind of work before so like my my work in the past has been much more sort of self self-generated you know get some arts council funding focus on this thing you know or self-funded um but yeah I suppose there's definitely it, it felt like a license it felt like a license to like Marge said sort of be experimental like I would never have suggested messing about with collages in a proposal for anything else before this but I think I think I think maybe when we talked about it in you know when you were first talking about the, the potential of these commissions when we were on crossing sectors um it kind of made me think I can put a, quite a wild proposal in and I, I didn't expect to get one of them at all because I thought nobody's going to commission me to collage with litter Honestly. but you know so that's kind of an interesting lesson for me yeah be a bit out there sometimes Marge, what about yeah you? just the same really I mean my photography commissions have mostly been either commercial or with museums and galleries who are commissioned me to do a particular exhibition say rather than um something I would define as socially engaged practice mm -hmm. so for me it was definitely just um just kind of pressure off in one way actually I know we talked like pressure on in terms of getting it done and getting the time but pressure was off in terms of coming up with something all singing or dancing that's going in a gallery space that needs to look beautiful um which I'm often used to so um yeah it's just the same as Kira really just that that opportunity to try new stuff and um and yeah learn learn from 
like I've learned loads from Kira during this and I've sent her stuff and and they're like what do you think about this and it's been interesting having the conversations with someone as well who's perhaps from a, a different kind of background um into like journalism and me with my comms so yeah it's been great just for trying different things out I think what's nice as well is just seeing so Kira I know when your presentation you sort of mentioned like I tried this and it didn't really work so I was able to sort of put it down and try something completely differently and then Marge you kind of expanded on 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 kind of your cyanotypes but then you also chose to do put and what <laughs> I've actually just dropped something and tried something. no but I think it's nice because what sometimes I think maybe with a bigger commission I don't know like I don't know people watching as well feel the same you feel that you have to kind of stick what there's your lane yeah. build on your lane you know like keep going yeah. with what you do and so in a way a micro commission is that freedom to play yeah. and I am a com I am a complete finisher so it doesn't always sit well with me so I feel like a little bit with mine that it's it's a bit bitty it's a bit like did this and did this line when I was joking there but because I was trying like a few different things out is that sense of actually never really quite got that finished and actually I think that's so yeah there's there's pros and cons isn't there but I, I feel like I've got to the end of it now and I've, it's kind of like a lot of funded projects isn't it you kind of you parachute in and then you parachute out again and I kind of feel like the stuff that I can maybe build on and take and do more with and I'm just going to kind of figure out how to do that um but yeah for me as someone who likes a firm end and a firm product it's been it's been a real challenge it's been a real challenge to just get over myself with that um but yeah I think I think I, I think I might have and I think there's, there's probably advantages and disadvantages to 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 both ways you know like maybe finding something that you really want to explore and sticking to that for the whole commission or trying lots of different things and coming at the end and going oh wow I've got like eight different products or types of work how does this all fit together but in terms of moving forward now you know where do you feel do you feel like hmm, okay I think it's come to its natural I mean actually are you going to say that when we're, <laughs> when we're no I think I need a two-year commission <laughs> to really explore it but you know is there something that you feel like oh there's definitely potential to open this up to a, a you know a wider project or you know yeah how do you feel so for me i'd like to say yes i can see a two year arts council funded for you know 10 <laughs> project in this but i'm not sure i can for me um because i think i kind of had such a run through of different techniques <laughs> and i don't think I don't think I don't think I could get much more mileage out of the collages, which I think were the most successful element. Well, I mean, look, the other people's contributions were great, obviously. But for, for me, like just proving to myself that I could make some some quite successful collages. Um, but I, I don't think I have the imagination to keep that technique going because I was struggling a bit to make them look, as you'll have noticed, some of them looked a bit same. Like some of them were really good, and I could see that they were like they they popped, and some of them were like a bit like, you know, oh another triangle, another circuit. Like I just didn't feel that they hanged together very well. Not as much, you know. Some of them, like you always get variation, don't you? Um, so I'm not sure. But however, the subject of litter is obviously a really important subject, and, and as is, is climate and 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 you know environment more generally. Mm -hmm. So it might be that I'm able to do something else on the same subject, but in a different way. I, maybe going out with people more because, like, it was kind of me dipping in, you know, spending half an hour at a litter pick, photographing everyone, and firing off because yeah. of summer holiday struggles at home and that kind of thing that's still, so, that's you know, still think, a bigger think, project isn't it it's i not... think there's definitely there's definitely potential i'm just not quite sure what it is i haven't figured it out at this point no that's good yeah i hear you and marge what about you well i think there's there's like i say, i think there's definitely legs to it i don't um i don't know about some of the stuff like you know the photography packs and all the rest of it but I think in terms of just the general approach with documenting and collecting the stories and archiving those stories and for me it feels like it's got long-term potential like 
revisiting in six months, revisiting 12 months, revisiting 18 months. It's like two, three, four, like to see how things have changed or going back to that that landscape and seeing what the what whether some of the stories that people are saying are now different or like whether they've changed their mind or whether you know the Ryder Cup has actually arrived at the Halton Park estate which is what is supposed to be happening you know like what's the it, for me I think there's something interesting to explore with the long term um but yeah I've not figured that out yet I think yours would then finally the grand finale would be people who live in those houses as well yeah yeah and the, the, there are people that contributed who are living in some of the new builds that have that have that have come in into West Saw in the last say like you know six to twelve months. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- there's definitely stuff you could do more of. I think for me, it's how much how much I want to position myself as an artist working in in like that emotive, you know, potentially controversial settings that might require me to develop a harder skin or a like particular like skill different skill set to be able to deal with it like I remember having conversation or email exchange with you Emma at the start of this about oh am I am I allowed to take photos at this building site or not in this building site area or you know it's like it's like that stuff that because I'm fairly new to um to all of this I, I, I need I probably need a bit more handholding through that I'd also um, say, I think, you know, regardless of whether you're new to this type of work or you've been doing it for a long time, like if, if, if you are, I don't know, if, you, if, if you're sensitive to that or if you worry about, you know, difficult situations or, you know, I know that I definitely find it very, very difficult. I find it difficult asking people to take part in things because I'm always like, oh, God, I'm just bothering everyone. <laughs> you know, like it really takes me a lot to sort of, step out and just be like do you want to be involved in this project and so yeah it comes back to that why doesn't it and like yeah. you know am I using my photography as a route for activism or am I using it as a way to open a, a conversation with you know people about a particular topic and health and, and have, have that has a health and well-being benefit yeah. to them or you know I'm doing quite a work, bit of work in my community now with autistic adults and teaching them photo skills and they're just having a great time playing around with it all and I get a lot of benefit out of that so it's I need to work out for me like where where I'm at really and what what I want to do more of and and what what I enjoy yeah that's really interesting actually because I maybe that is another another conversation as well in terms of sort of socially engaged practice and how it it's parallel really with sort of activism and it is a very passionate area and you end up being plonked right in the middle of that um, and also taking people's opinions and stories and and very personal feelings about something and then be, being responsible for putting it out there in the world that's that's the middleman isn't it that um can get you into trouble or you know you have to be very careful the line that you're walking I guess and yeah, and that there's a, there's a kind of ethical dimension to that isn't there yeah um, you know you need to take care of people and not sort of exploit them by taking take 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 yeah. Um, yeah. and also for yourselves as well I think we all need to be taking care of ourselves too um so I think that's actually quite a nice sort of place to start to wrap up. I'm just going to check in the chat if there's any more questions, but I think we had them all, I think. And I might just wait a minute just in case something comes in. Um, Let's see. Thank you both. That was great. Literally, we could chat all (laughs) all night about this. Um, No more questions. No, we're good. Um, Okay, so I will sum up for this evening. Um, So before we go, I'd just like to mention um, our upcoming gallery show, which is called Collective Matters. Um, The show celebrates our socially engaged practice through a showcase of art made collaboratively with our local communities, um, alongside a programme of interactive sessions, talks and workshops. We open at the end of September, closing mid-December, and we're excited to share that the Crossing Sectors cohort, including Marge and Kira, will be showing highlights from their own uh, projects on our digital window gallery as part of the show. 
Um, so please do try and come along to the show and um, join us online if you're not local. Um, but I want to thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's been lovely to hear about the work you've both been doing. Um, and I look forward to seeing how, if they do continue on into something uh, bigger. Um, and thank you all for watching, whoever's joined us tonight. Um, we can't see you, but uh, we hope you've been enjoying the sunshine. And we hope you have a lovely evening. And I think that's everything from us as the light is disappearing as I'm talking. Um, so, yeah, good evening, everybody. And have a good rest of your week.